could always hold our own, hold our own and, and then some as well. So it was like, well, you know, for example, when we're playing in the 91 World Cup and we, we, we lost to the All Blacks in the quarterfinal, but you know, we won the second half. That's right. right. <laughs> we didn't win the war, but we yeah. won a good part of this battle. Right. Right. Um, but people don't understand the passion that, that, that there is behind rugby. It's kind of like the samurai sport there, like that and obviously um, sumo. Or, <laughs> but uh, are, these are the, the, the big macho sports over there. And um, I mean, you can go to a university game in, in, in Tokyo, uh, sort of Waseda Meiji game, and there's going to be 60, 70, 75,000 people watching 20 year old rugby. Obviously, to the sport of rugby, we feel that rugby really teaches life skills and disciplines and communication. It has all the right uh, aspects of, of how to grow a person, especially these kids who are so disadvantaged and lacking role models. So we can really make a big change and a big difference in these kids' lives. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. You are now tuned in to the greatest. The greatest of all time. The greatest of all time. Welcome to the Rugby Swag Show. Welcome to another episode of Rugby Swag. My name is Gift Gift Time Bailu, and I am so happy to have you guys here for today. We got a great, great, great guest for you today. But before we get it started, I need you to go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. Let me know that you like this video and let the people know that you they need to come and watch this one as well. I appreciate you guys for taking the time to do it. Of course, that's not all that we do here. I need you guys to know that if you want to absolutely go follow us outside of what we do here on YouTube. I want you guys to go check out our social media pages at Rugby Swag Show on Instagram at Gift A Bailu, that is G I F T E G B E L U on X, and at Gift Time Rugby everywhere else. That is Facebook, that is Twitch, that is right here on YouTube, youtube.com slash Gift Time Rugby. And of course, of course, of course, uh, literally on TikTok at Gift Time Rugby as well. But I'm it's not just for them. It's not just for the visuals. Yo, if you only want to be able to take a listen while you're working out, while you're driving, while you're taking your kid, while you're taking your friends, while you're taking your family, while you're taking your spouse, you go where you need to and let them know about what's going on in this here rugby world and let them know that they need to be a part of this because this is the most important thing that needs to happen in this moment. You guys can check us out on our audio streaming platforms on Spotify, Apple Music, Apple Podcasts, on Amazon Music, at iHeartRadio, um, uh, on, on just about any major platform where podcasts are hold, we're going to be right there. So, guys, I am so excited to have you, and I hope that you guys are excited for the episode today. Today, of course, we got a special guest, the amazing, the marvelous Eddie Evans. Now, if you guys don't know who this is, this man is a legend by his own right. Man is Canadian rugby player. Man played in a 1995 Rugby World Cup. Man played in Japan, in Japan Rugby League One. The man is the co-host and uh, literally the founder of the Bangkok 10s tournament. If you guys don't remember, that's where I'm at right now. That's where I'm heading to right now, all right? When this is, when we're posting, this is where I'm heading to at this moment. And this is an event that is absolutely one of the top rugby events in Asia. I didn't say in Thailand. I didn't say in Southeast Asia. I said one of the top events in Asia. This man is visionary. This man is a philanthropist. Of course, you can find him on our documentary, Singapore to Tokyo, any way we can, representing. And he's got an amazing story to be able to tell. I absolutely want you guys to be able to take a listen to this one because it is 100% worth it. But before we get to it, before we get to it, of course, we got to take care of some of our sponsor stuff, man. And of course, this is coming to you from Health Enhanced Food, the number one specialty food bread mix in the world, getting you the best bread 
for the health you need. And I always say, as rugby people, you absolutely need to make sure that you are paying attention to what goes inside your stomach. Y'all, we need to make sure our health is good, but it's not just to be healthy for health's sake. It's also so that we can make sure we can kill it on the field or have the energy in the stand or most importantly that we can make sure that this next generation is even better than the previous generation was and that they have the habits ready to go and the ease of being able to access it and health enhanced food definitely want to make that sure for any of your breaded desired needs you do not have to avoid it anymore and of course every single one has a different element that impacts a different part of your health definitely go check them out at healthenhancedfoods.com that's healthenhancedfoods.com now i'm not gonna hold you guys back anymore because look like i said I'm on my way over to Bangkok right now. I'm about to go and get my rugby on. I told it's been a journey to get here. I'm ready to get here. So I don't want to hold you guys back much longer. I want you to check out Eddie Evans, man, founder of Bangkok Tens. Man, check it out. I'm going to let you get back to the show in a moment, but I want to talk to you about our sponsors, Health Enhanced Foods, the best specialty flowers in the business. What does that mean for you? That is the flowers that allow you to be able to get the nutritious need from your bread made. That's muffins, bread, croissants, whatever, pancakes and muffins. It will give you the opportunity to be able to get the best while still being able to eat like you wanted to. We have various amounts of products available for those who have special dietary needs to those who are looking for a special health outcome. And of course, because they're part of the rugby swag show, we want to let you know that you got a chance to go to healthenhancedfoods.com and use code rugby swag to be able to get 20% off your first order. Y'all, this is something that you're going to need. You got to build up, have your energy at the best, be the maximum. It's 2024. Let's do the best. But now, I want you guys to get into it. Let's get back to the show. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Rugby Swag. We got a special guest for you today. Yo, this is one of my guys, and I've known him since 2017. But this guy is a legend in his own. He is a Rugby World Cup. He played against Jonah Lomu, 1995. This man has created such a mark in Asia rugby, especially in Thailand, particularly in Thailand, with the Bangkok Tens Tournament, which I said I'm going over to it. Man, this is the legend, Canadian rugby star, and of course, business personality, and uh, just dope, dude. Eddie Evans. Eddie, brother, welcome to the show. <laughs> wow, gift. That's an introduction. Man. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> overwhelming. We come, in, we come in hard, Eddie. We come in hard. No, 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 that was a gift. It's, it's like I said, I mean, met you a long, many, many years ago in Tokyo and uh, uh, heard, heard about you through the grapevine from some of the Tokyo Gaijin boys you've played with over the years as well. And uh, they all had great things to say about you. So it was a real pleasure uh, seeing you in Tokyo, also hosting you at, uh, I think it was the 2020 or the 2019 uh, Bangkok Rugby Tens. Yeah. And you just finished yeah. an epic ride across Asia somewhere. I saw some photos of you driving across, across rice paddies in Cambodia. And I'm like, these guys are the real deal. Then you show up on, on Saturday morning and play about 20 games of 10s rugby. I mean, yeah, you got game, brother. Yo, look, you know, it's, it's, the, right, it's the right amount of crazy, right? Like, yeah. whenever we do this, we're just like, there's no logic to it. But, you know, yeah. it feels good. <laughs> and it was good, Gip, because I think uh, at the time – uh, you were uh, riding with um, the guy from Malaysia. Jason. Uh, yeah, Jason. And you guys were doing a bit of a fundraiser, um, I believe, correct? Yep. And you're trying to raise some money for some uh, some youth in, in Southeast Asia, some needy needy kids. So it's kind of close to my heart. That's what you know we're all about on this side of things. Like our tournament is a is a fundraiser. It's a nonprofit, and we support an orphanage here in Thailand, and they're called the the Mighty Naksu, which is a noble warrior in Thai, and uh, so we've got about 120 kids and we've had this program now for about close to 10 years. And we basically support and mentor these kids. And obviously through the sport of rugby, we feel that rugby really teaches life skills and disciplines and communication. It has all the right uh, aspects of, of how to grow a person, especially these kids who are so disadvantaged and lacking role models. 
so we can really make a big change and a big difference in these kids' lives. And that's that's what this thing is all about. So it's just not us going out there and playing bad rugby, <laughs> drinking too much beer over a weekend. It's uh, there's a point point behind it, and uh, and luckily, you know, our tournament's been so solid this year. As you'll see when you come over in February, mm -hmm. three and a half weeks from now, um, we've got about two thousand players coming this year, and um, we've nice. got a huge uh, waiting list of teams that just to, didn't get in this year just because they waited too long. But it just shows the strength of, of, of our tournament and how we've grown this thing from scratch into like one of the most internationally recognized social rugby tens tournament in the world. So, yeah. yeah. I'll be honest with you. Like whenever I actually came to visit it, the first time I found out it was 2017, whenever I went with Tokyo Gaijin. And it yeah. was actually because of your tournament that gave me the confidence where I was like, oh, this is how you do in a rugby event. Because prior to, the only time you get something like that would be with, yeah. like, international test. And even yeah. at that, it wasn't even to that extent. It was, you know, yeah, you got some games here around, but, like, on field, like, the full shebang, absolutely yeah. not. And definitely never from a social level. So yeah. that idea had been what seeded what I wanted to do with the HBCU Rugby Classic and has yeah. been, like, the basis for that because I was like, it was the most eye-opening thing. I was like, "Yo, wait, we got cheerleaders. Yo, we got the band over here. Like the yeah. the, uh, the 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 pregame for the players. Like even as just social players, you feel like a star. We got this meal. Everybody's just like, I was like, this is beyond anything I imagined. I, I never expected it, even coming out of Asia. Because again, when we're talking about rugby, especially over in the U.S., let alone other countries, but especially in the U.S. Everybody knows South Pacific area. Everybody yeah. knows South Africa and then Europe. But the the type of rugby that is played, and more so the way that you guys, the way that events are done, it's 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 bar none. So I, I'd like yeah. to give you a lot of credit because I don't think I've ever told you that, but it yeah. legitimately is, yeah. I appreciate that, Gibbs. And like one of the things I thought about, I mean, I. I've been living here. I, I, I've been living here for about four years and I've been doing a lot of these local tournaments and I've been to Dubai, I've been to Hong Kong, <clears throat> been to Cambodia, I've been to Laos, been, done all these local tennis tournaments. And there is always something really good about each of those tournaments. And I would say, hmm, if I could take that, that, and that and bring that back to Bangkok and just combine all the great stuff that I loved about those tournaments uh, and create something new, I just thought, geez, there's a formula there. And that's what I, I essentially did. And, you know, year one, I just I tried to make it uh, relatively social, but still, you could still play some good footy. Um, there's an opportunity there just through the seeds and things like that, and the you know the the cup uh, cup plate and bowl matches, so they could get knocked down and you can get knocked up or pushed up, right? So it's mm -hmm. always for those good teams, you're always going to get good get get good footy, but for the for the weaker teams, they're still going to find their level and they're still going to yeah. enjoy a really healthy competition. So there's going to be a great great rugby. Um, available secondly just socially like just making sure that we got a great beer garden great tunes great atmosphere I, and splash it on a bit like make sure that the guys got coupons make sure you buy these guys yeah. a you know just do it right like just you know don't cheap out on this just you know go out and work your butt off find some sponsors so that we can subsidize this thing and make everybody enjoy it love it and then the word gets out that you've got a quality quality product you know and that's that's what i think we've done no and and that is I, I think an absolute blueprint. I think it's an absolute blueprint uh, yeah. that that works. So before we kind of go into, because I do want to ask you even more and talk to you more about that and that uh, moving forward. But I do want to get a little bit the background. And I always tell people, look, every superhero has their origin story. So Eddie, hey, <laughs> you're ready? Yo, tell me, how did you get started with rugby? Wow. Yeah, because she's many, many, many moons ago. So I was. I mean. This is kind of a wild thing, but I, um, I'm originally from the Yukon, which is up by Alaska. So, I mean, the only thing we have, to have up there is probably dog sleds and snowshoeing and maybe a bit of ice hockey. Like it's really <laughs> frozen for eight months of the year. Um, so uh, the educational system at the time in the Yukon wasn't, wasn't the top, like it wasn't the best. And my, I, I think my parents were always concerned about, you know, trying to find a better solution for me. I was a very active kid. I was fairly large and, and I was doing a bit of judo and doing a bit of wrestling. And, but I was a very you know, like physical, strong kid and I needed, I needed a team sport. 
And so part of the fact that the educational system was a bit weak in the Yukon and the fact that I wasn't getting, getting enough sport, I, my, my parents made the decision to send me to a private school, um, which is more on the West Coast of Canada towards Washington State, Oregon, that, that kind of uh, – I know that some of you American viewers aren't good at geography. <laughs> So I'll, I'll kind of narrow it down. We know geography. Believe. <laughs> anyway, so I went to a typical, I guess it was set up as an English type school where you did your cricket, you did your rowing, you did your, uh, and you did your rugby. And uh, so um, I, I just fell in love with it. Right. And um, I was very like, already I was a, you know, a big, strong guy. And I, and I loved the, the confrontational aspect of it. I love the, the team aspect of it, the bonding. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I went through all the, the school grades and graduated from, from Shawnee Lake Boys School. And it was, like I say, it was a boarding school. So I was living there for um, eight, 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 eight and a half months of the year. Yeah. And then I uh, went on to UBC, uh, University of British Columbia, and played there and had a great, great career there. And I was kind of tinkering be between rugby and American, or we call it American football here just because mm -hmm. if you get mixed up with football, they think you're playing soccer, right? So I say American football, right? <laughs> so uh, anyway, so I was playing fullback um, at a high level. And then at the same time, I was uh, during the, uh, so that was my summer sport and winter sport was, um, was rugby. And then it came to a point, I think I was 19 or 20, where I had to make a decision. And uh, I, uh, I kind of knew that, Playing for the CFL was about as good as it's going to get for me, and I would make about, I don't know, like about thirty thousand dollars a year if I was going up. <laughs> I mean, was it going to, I wasn't going to make a make a lot of money doing that. Yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, and I just loved rugby, and uh, and I, you know, I thought perhaps at that point I'd already played for the U nineteen Canadian team, and you know, I, I just the people I met through rugby was amazing, and and that to me. That, that was kind of the environment I, I was leaning towards, like, you know, that, that network of that rugby fraternity. And I just, I just love the vibe. And uh, so I stuck with rugby and uh, went over to New Zealand for, for a season when I was, uh, I took a gap between a university and then spent a, spent a year in the UK. And then um, by that time I was playing pretty much full time for Canada. Wait, um, real quick, yeah. just before you continue on, you, you talk about sure. the split on going from CFL and going into rugby, but at the time that you were going into rugby, rugby wasn't yes. professionalized at that point, correct? No, well, it wasn't, but I mean, there was there's still opportunity there, Gift. Like you were still, I mean, even though I went, like going to a place like, like New Zealand when it's still the amateur age or, or the UK when I played for the London Scottish or, or Blackheath, I mean, there's, there's, they had, there was an old thing. They had the thing of the boot, the boot, the boot money. Come <laughs> from afterwards, and there'd be a, a few English notes in the bottom of your boot. You know, it was like, and they, they covered things. They got you a good job, and and right. um, I just, uh, but I, I knew at some point that even if I, 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 I wasn't like my whole goal wasn't just trying to make a bunch of cash out of rugby, right. out, out of football. I just wanted to have a, a an enjoyable sporting. Um, uh, like a passion that I could really feel good about, you know, like what, how am I going to use this to enjoy my life? And maybe I could open a few doors here and there. And I, I thought with rugby, like, you know, there was, there was opportunity outside of the sport, like just with the quality of people involved, like, you know, the educated, you know, well-connected people. And I thought, geez, these guys might be able to pull some strings and get me a job as a bouncer or something. So <laughs> I don't know. Right. <laughs> but anyway, um, no, I mean, it, 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 that, that to me was, more more of my goal was just to and playing for your country too gift was yeah. like you know that was that's a that was a pretty pretty big deal to me it was like geez i'm here's this you know this chubby kid from from the yukon who who you know didn't even know nothing about any kind of sport yeah. until he was 11 years old and then all of a sudden you know he's probably going to play for Canada at some point but that was that was a big thing for me and uh um you know so i was a proud canadian and that and that's that's the path i wanted to follow is representing canada was this something that even – did you have, like, family that also was, like, athletic? Like, you were obviously – you know, obviously you, you discovered late – no, late. Yeah. 11 years old is, quote, quote, late. Yeah. But, like, did you have other family that had sporting aspirations or or did other athletic endeavors that also kind of fed into that as well? Well, just because my family are all from northern Canada, I mean, everyone they, – they all just skated. They played a bit of hockey here and there, right? Yeah. Um, but I don't think they had that – the, the real drive I, that I think my parents saw in me that, that I could, you know, there's a reason they wanted to send me to a private school and you know spend all their savings. It was, they, they felt that that would 
best to me and, and, and help me find my way and provide me a sport, something like rugby that would uh, kind of cater to, to the type of guy, the, the, uh, yeah. the toughness and aggression. Cause I mean, like I said, I like, I like doing my judo. I like doing my wrestling, but I wanted to do a, I wanted to do a team sport. Right. That, yeah. like, I can imagine like it can get oh, oh, pretty tiring. Like, just being like, yo, I don't want to just solo this the entire time. Like, I want to be yeah. able to, I want to hang with yeah. my boys. I want to have my friends while I'm also getting a chance to yeah. train out, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's it. I mean, that's a bit simplified version. But yeah, I mean, I think, I think that was, that, that was in, in, inside me. And then my parents saw that too. And, I, and also they, I thought they, they, they figured that would provide me going to, going to a school at that level, open up those doors. Like, yeah. You know, I, it is what it is. But uh, if you go to a proper, you know, boarding school in Canada, that's that yeah. helps you. It's just it's, it's reality, you know. Yeah. It- it, it, it is. It, I mean, it's, it, it's like going into like, the reason why people say go to Ivy Leagues. It's not necessarily because the education is so I mean, it's good. It's great. But yeah. it's those people who that That's network it. that you tap into. Yes. And, and I was too at the time I was too young to, to really appreciate it and understand it. But my parents got it right away. And, uh, you know, they knew that if I didn't get out of the Yukon, I'm, it, it probably would have not ended well for me either. Like I just it's a it was a sort of there wasn't a lot of opportunity there. Right. Yeah. And, and so they, they made the sacrifice and, you know, they, my, my parents weren't super rich or anything, but you know, they, they made a sacrifice to send me to a boarding school. And that, that was really good. Cause that changed my life. So when you went to New Zealand, was it almost kind of that same aspect where it's like, I go to New Zealand. I know that from a rugby standpoint, there's like a, the, the, this is Mecca of rugby right here in, in this part of the world that it was almost, this will access me to other people as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, it was, it was such a cool experience. Um, it just broadened your horizons. Like I toured to New Zealand as a, as a kid at, when I was at, at the school at Sean again. Um, and I just, wow. I mean, touring and playing rugby and meeting new people. Whoa, so exciting. So when I had the opportunity to do this thing in, 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 in New Zealand for a season, it was like, Wow, like I would, I would have, you know, gave a left arm for that, and and luckily I, I you know, I applied and and, you know, I, I made it, made it through, and so I got sent there, and, and they paid for everything and took care of me, and uh, what what here was a neat thing about I played for a club called uh, uh, Auckland Grammar, which mm-hmm. was the first division, first grade club in New Zealand at the time, and we had quite a few New Zealand players in the club that I got to play with, right? But so they got me this kind of hokey part time job. Uh, on the docks, like like unloading unloading stuff, like unloading these huge containers. And I was just a young kid, and I was like, ah, oh, I can lift boxes all day, right? <laughs> so I remember going down there one one Monday. I think it was one of the first f- first days I started working there. Uh, it was just like I say, it's just part time fun job, you know. Um, and then I remember seeing Joe Stanley and Alan Wetton in this in the containers, helping me pick out these boxes. You know, you might not know these names, Gift, but. I had just watched these guys play against Australia wow. on the Saturday, all black <laughs> versus Australia. And here I am all of a sudden unloading containers in Auckland Harbor with these all blacks. That's wild. Was, Yo, you, <laughs> this, this is one of those situations where you go like, man, you're my, like, meet your heroes, but they're, you are them and they are you. And literally, wow. <laughs> and that was the beauty of the sport. You know, we, um, here I am working with these guys who just played before. Millions and millions and millions of people, um, you know, watching this huge rugby game, and they're just they're just trying to earn a buck at this point. Um, and if there's like having said that, and you mentioned about the money factor of rugby, yeah. if there's ever, if there's ever a case to say, listen, you you've got to help these guys out. The fact that you've actually got these guys, these All Blacks, having to carry crates and boxes around in, in, to unload, you know, boats do, who are docked in Auckland Harbor, I mean, there's something wrong with that. To me, right. anyway, you you play, you reach that level of rugby, and you're getting back in the day, you're getting absolutely zero, and you're yet you're 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 putting that much effort into the sport, and you're, and you're playing top club rugby, you're sacrificing your body, right? Because you don't know when you get injured, you get injured, then what? Nothing, zero, right? And it's like these guys have to have to move crates to make a living, feed their families. Right. <laughs> Crazy, that's right? insane. So, yeah, no, and and I feel like that's one of those things where. We even see that in in this era, as we're continuing to try and develop this rugby, let's call it industry uh, as a whole, right? Like yeah. we're still in this position where we're we're trying to find what is it that 
gives the guys enough to compensate for the amount of work that has to be put onto the body as, as anything while simultaneously maintaining that spirit where you're also feeling it like how you had like this guy is me like he's working right next to me and yeah. i feel connection with him and yeah. which is why i want to watch him that much more uh perform as well as how well they play so it's like yeah. trying to find that balance between it right yeah absolutely i mean and don't get me wrong they i mean Alan and Joe, they were they were down there, just big smiles on their faces, and we're just having a good yarn, and we're talking about Canada, and you know, all, sharing stories, and uh, you know, it was uh, it was awesome. And you know, uh, a year and a half later, when when the All Blacks came and played played against uh, my province in, in British Columbia, and I was playing, and uh, and that was the first real big game I played in, um, and I was just a kid, I was like maybe 20, 21, and I was playing in the front row. Uh, you know, which was back in the back in the late '80s, early '90s. Playing in the front row, you had to have some balls, right? Because it wasn't like all these referees were going to save your ass, or the nose were going to save your ass. It was you had manu manu stuff going on. So being a 20 year old and having to prop against a legendary guy like uh, Richard Lowe, who yeah. was <laughs> very very infamous, you know, tight head, and he uh, he was a tough he was a tough character, right? And uh, it was it was super intimidating, but I mean, you you just have to rise to these challenges once in a while, and or not once in a while, and, and all these times. But that was a young guy, and that was my first real like test. Even though it wasn't a test match, we were just but it was playing the All Blacks, and you know it was like Buck Shelford and and you know Zinzan Brook and all those old legends. Um, so yeah, and we did well. We did well in the scrums. You know, it, we didn't win the game, but uh, it wasn't <laughs> all out by any means. And you know, we we could you know, we could look them in the eye and we, we, we walked off the field, you know, uh, heads high. So, yeah. um, but yeah, it was just, it's, it's, it's just crazy, you know, coming from having worked with these guys in the containers to <laughs> playing against them on the field a year and a half later. It's just, it's a neat, neat story. I think, you know, you, you mentioned something about being able to play these guys as a young, younger, I always wonder that do you, and maybe you, you can put it as perspective, but whenever you were playing, I feel like the rugby world was ironically smaller. Obviously, like less places playing at a time. So possibly more opportunity to play bigger teams versus maybe today where yeah. we have so many teams now. But it feels like the opportunity to play specific levels, especially if you're in that tier two range going to tier one, is much smaller. Do you, do you feel like in your observation, you had a better opportunities of playing those? larger teams those australia south africa's or is it just perspective just uh opportunity you, you know gift it, it's 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 odd because canada as 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 a rugby nation we were always really large and physical and yeah we always could compete in a lot of ways on against any team in the world mm -hmm. just because of our physicality and and i i wouldn't say we were we weren't skilled players we we were we were just hard hard guys, right. and so that carried carried us through. And we were we we were always sort of ranked in the top twelve. I think we might have made seven or eight back in the mid. We beat France, we beat England, and we beat Wales, and we beat uh, someone else, Scotland. That's, I think. that's not we small. <laughs> Yo. so we you know we, so for my career, we were always that sort of top, at least top ten, and so we were always in that tier one. So I didn't, I didn't really see what was happening with the Portugals or the Spains, you know, or, or, or you know, who, who else? I mean, I don't know some of the other teams that that came through recently, but uh, we didn't have that. So, so the, the Uruguay's people, you know, teams like that, we were always like the Argentina and the the all black. We're we're up there. We got invited to go yeah. play in England. We got invited to go to France on a tour. We got, you know, we 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 were given that opportunity. So. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I think there was always that tier two and tier three, and you'd see these yeah. teams like Belgium play, you know, Switzerland. You go, oh, geez, you see about 15 people in the crowd going, that's not a lot of fun. No one's even, <laughs> no one even, you're not even on the radar, right? But I mean, I don't know what my point is exactly, but I mean, I think I just feel fortunate at the time that we were, we were one of those teams that was getting a lot of rugby and we we're playing yeah. in competitions, we we're being invited. Uh, as one-off tests, the November test, we were we were involved in those games, right? Um, now, unfortunately, we've we've just nosedived, and uh, we 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 we'd hard we have a hard time getting a game against you know Portugal or or, or you know you know Cambodia, or, right? You know, 
it's <laughs> unfortunate. We need to really build up our program as you guys do as well. And we're both right. being shit kicked right now. And right. uh, we need to turn things around because this World Cup, you know, in, in nine years, seven years, seven years, seven years, right? In the US, it's basically our backyard. So we right. both our programs need to really pull up our socks and, and literally get our shit together because, you know, this is going to showcase our sport in North America. And it's, we're going to get the sports going to be on TV. And, and, you know, that's never happened. In, you know, a lot over the, over the years, none of us are good and good, good press coverage or anything like that for our sport. So right. either Canada or the United States. So, you know, we need to really get there. Like we need to make, make sure that we put on a good show for the North American fans. Right. You know, I, it, it, it's interesting and continue on with other stuff, but it's interesting because I always feel like that 2019 rugby world cup set a standard for it. And yeah. you've been to more rugby world cups than I have. So you have a better perspective on it. But I felt like whatever what happened in Japan was unusual in the factor of the mixture between the crowd engagement, the level of play, and the maybe the the, the way the country embraced uh, right. how the Rugby World Cup went. So wow. now instead of what you get, where it's just like okay, we put on the event, people come to the stadium, ha de ho, we watch a game, we go on to the next. Now it's like oh wait. Everybody has to be involved. Like, I felt like Japan educated their people about what they expect from rugby, how to treat the tourists that go through, and then went forward. I don't know how France ended up being, and I feel like the Olympics might be in better, might show a little bit more, but I don't know how France is, but I feel like the U.S. has to compare to what uh, Japan did in, in rugby, where it's a total country element and not just that community. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Uh, Japan was... It was very special and I, I mean people but people also lose fact like i played in japan you know that was my first real professional stint was i played there almost 10 years 10 seasons right for ibm um but I, people don't understand the passion that, that that there is behind rugby it's kind of like the samurai sport there like that and obviously um sumo or <laughs> but uh like, these are the, the, the big macho sports over there and um i mean you can go to a university game in, in, in Tokyo, uh, sort of Waseda Meiji game. And there's yeah. going to be 60, 70, 75,000 people watching 20 really? year old rugby. Yeah. So you don't, I mean, we don't, you don't see that because we don't, it, it's not visible, but yeah. there's a lot of passion. There's a lot of support behind rugby uh, in, in Japan. Um, all, all the, a lot of, a lot of large corporations all back, all have a, a corporate team. Like oh, this year, God. for example, we've got a team coming. We've got quite a few Japanese teams coming to the tens this year. And one of them, I believe, is the JAL team, Japan Airlines. Wow. So, wow. I mean, who ever thought that you'd have a Japan Airlines rugby team, <laughs> you know? But they have that. And, and I, you know, you play, you know, you've got Suntour, you've got uh, Yamaha, you've got yeah. uh, Toyota, you've got, you know, like all these, you know, Kobe Seiko. These are the big teams in Japan who have, like, hundreds of year history in rugby. Like, they've been playing it for a long, long time. And, and they do have a lot of pride. So yeah. um, I, I don't think it was – I mean – it's not a shock to me that they embraced it because they love it. They're passionate about it. Right. Um, it, it. What I loved about going there as a non-player and just enjoying join uh, like a rugby rugby World Cup. It was just you're right. The whole the whole country backed it. Everything was rugby rugby World Cup. Right. And I, I I I'm I'm hopeful that you can in the states you guys can get just a little bit of that going. I know how difficult it is with all the other sports you guys have and and your right. main sports that are well-known U.S. sports, right? And rugby still isn't at that level. But having said that, you look at some of the games when you guys played, um, when you hosted Ireland in, in, in the All Blacks in, uh, I think, Chicago Stadium or something. Yep, I think that would be exactly. 2014, 2016, yeah. yeah. And you sell these 80,000-seat 80, 80, stadiums out. I mean, I think you're, we're going to get that in the States. Right. We're going to get packed stadiums like that because people want to be involved because Americans love 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 sport right. and they love contact sports too right so exactly. they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna go to be involved right and even if like, it's like when you go to the rugby sevens here we got we got you know you, there, i think there's one in la there's one in vancouver i go to the rugby sevens in vancouver and i swear to god there's probably 80 percent of the people in that stadium thirty-five thousand people who, who don't even know what the rules are but they're just there to party and have fun and be part of the whole event right and i think that's going to be experience pretty pretty uh, similar to how how it's how it handles in um in the states so with americans supporting the sport 
and that's and, and I think that's the biggest hope, you know. And and it, you look, you you keep pu- pushing on on points that I really like to point on, which is where the the way that Japan rugby runs even their professional side and how that adds to the engagement. So I know whenever the creation of Major League Rugby was was brought on, the idea was something between Premiership and Japan uh, Japan um, Japan Rugby League One. And uh, finding ways to be able to either interconnect it with your club side and then obviously sponsor it in. And I feel like Japan League One has been considered as one of the premieres. It's like top 14, Japan League One, premiership in terms of modeling, right? So obviously you played with them, as you just said, for 10 years. How was it whenever you played? Because I'm still very confused as to how it functions consistently while also being able to provide development because we know everybody goes there we've seen dan carter over there we've seen even todd clever over there like almost at least a great majority of major players yourself included went from playing major test to playing in japan so i guess if you can give explain like how it worked for you for me personally i mean it, it, it goes back to what i talked about before is like I was really fortunate to play in a really strong Canadian team. And I mean, for example, our, 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 our forwards, we had, we had some big dudes and very, very large, angry guys. And I mean, we we're physical. And I think um, had, when I was, when we were being watched and, and compared to other teams and how we played and things like that, we, we would always hold our own, hold our own and, and then some as well. So it was like, well, you know, for example, when we're playing in the 91 world cup and we, you know, we, we lost to the All Blacks in the quarterfinal, but, you know, we won the second half. That's right. Why I look at it. <laughs> we didn't win the war, but we yeah. won a good part of this battle. Right? So anyway, I mean, we had a lot of eyes on us. And, and um, you know, we, I had some I had an offer in Italy and a couple offers in France and back in the UK and then Japanese thing. And it was like, so there was definitely people paying attention to us, right? right. Um, and, you know, so I, I think – Playing at that level, and you know they're gonna they they took they I don't want to like seem arrogant or anything, but they 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 could pick who they want to take because the Japanese they have great salary system over there. They take right. care of their their players very very well. They pay you a really good wage, uh, you know, and and you know they take care of you. And there's also the fact that because it's not the most physical brand of rugby in Japan, like you know, even though it's hard, don't get me wrong, yeah. it's super, super difficult to play there. I mean, the, the training is insane. But I mean, it is not as physical as it would be, say, in in, in the UK or in, or in you know South Africa or you know mm-hmm. these places are like just the confrontationally. You know, you run into bigger guys every weekend. Japan, it's quick, fast, you know, but it's not that same level of intense co- uh, contact that it would be. So your longevity is a lot a lot uh, longer there, and that's yeah. one of the reasons I was able to you know play ten years there is because I wasn't getting you know killed every weekend like physically <laughs> you know after any game like it was tough don't get me wrong but it wasn't like i, I can't see me down that yeah. for 10 years in in france like come on forget about it you know you get beat up in the front row and it's just like uh you know that so that was i felt super fortunate and that's all because of my team like playing for a, a, you know i was lucky to be playing for a strong canadian team we made we, we beat some really good teams back in the 90s and it was like you know they that paved the way for my success playing overseas yeah so yeah. the structure for how they did it, though, like um, we all know that it, it was always connected to the company teams, the, the companies yeah. themselves. Right. But yeah. like what was the advantage for if you know what's the yeah. advantage for the company to be able to have this rugby squad? Like why would they want to invest this much into the players to, to come through? Yeah. You know, it's I think in the old days, historically, um, I think it was about company morale. Yeah. Yeah. So they'd go out with their, you know, uh, Toyota flags in, in, in the stadiums, you know, cheer the cheer the boys on. So they, you know, Japanese have a really strong work ethic and they work their asses off all week. And then they don't, they like to like let go. You know, you know that gift. You've been right. in Japan. I, 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 yeah. Yeah. My guys uh, have very much shown. Well yeah. don't, let don't, let, don't, don't let their quiet uh, demeanors fool you. So when they go out to the games and it was just a really good way for them to have like a, for, for one, I mean, their life is their company and, and seeing right. their team on the field doing well, they feel real, like real strong pride. And then it just, it was just a bit of an outlet for, I think for the company and the, and the employees. 
but then it just started to grow and grow and and I mean, geez. So I was probably one of the first waves, and then a lot of the All Blacks started coming over. A lot of guys I played against, like you know Jamie Joseph and Aaron Penny, mm-hmm. and you know, um, geez, uh, uh, Graham Bashup, and a whole bunch of them that I played against in '95 at, at the not you know before the World Cup, and then in South Africa mm-hmm. at the World Cup. But there was a whole new wave that came in '95 when rugby went professional, and a lot of these guys had just thought, you know what, I've been playing rugby, high level rugby for a long time, and I can play in Japan. I can make. It, I can treat it properly. Uh, these, you know, and, and so that was. I think that behind it is like guys. Guys were, you know. Sorry, I think I don't want to lose track of what we're talking about. But yeah. So the, the company really took care of our employees, including right. the rugby guys and, and us, us skyjin guys, which is foreigner in, in Japanese, right? So they took care of us really well, and they they respected and admired us. And and I and I think. Um, that makes it very attractive to, to go mm-hmm. there and, and play corporate rugby. Um, and like you say, like, like the Japanese are fanatic, fanatical rugby player, r- rugby mad um, fans. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it just, it was the right, it's a right, it's a right move. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey everybody, this is just the break train sending out a personal little video diary to all you people out there where I am going to document me riding most of the way between Singapore and Tokyo for the 2019 Rugby World Cup. It's number one is because um, it's part of my business, I do Rugby Lovers Guide to Asia. Number two is I want to bring a lot of exposure to the, to the rugby clubs and the rugby NGOs and charities. Also on a personal level I just want to break uh, the funk I've kind of felt I've been into for the last 10 years. So for the next 12 months, I poured myself into the Singapore to Tokyo campaign, but it still wasn't enough. I needed help, and it came from Louisiana. We in Singapore, baby! Gift from Gift Time Rugby USA is a extroverted tour de force. Say hi to my people out there. <laughs> which makes up for my um social shortcomings. This place is unbelievable. No! It's not just it's like What's he supposed to do? Morons, a bunch of morons. Guys, picture with me. Picture. Australian. G'day mate. You can use my phone. But what unites us is a hunger for adventure. After KL, Kuala Lumpur. Fuji, baby! Our love of Asian rugby culture. One, two, three, set yeah. yeah. Rugby is, is starting to develop here in Cambodia for women as well. Valkyries, the mighty, mighty Valkyries! The mighty and allows us to overcome incredible, incredible obstacles. It's just got so thick. It's just so thick here. Now it's pouring down rain again. But coming to this Thai-Cambodia border has renewed all the aggression. So the whole thing's gone buggered. I got hit. What? I got Thailanded by a motorbike. I can just feel that knee, that ankle just going in all the wrong directions under the weight of my body. But that doesn't compare to the pain of, of failure. I'm dying. Oh, I'm dying. And that's what I've been worried about this whole time. We're out here, we're running out of energy, we're running out of money, and we're feeling isolated. And yet at that critical moment, friends, family, sometimes complete strangers, come on board. Before you know it, we're back in the game. Tokyo, here we come. Making a comeback. Four weeks, 2,300 miles. Malaysia, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam. After all the trials and tribulations, this ride had become deeply personal. All that mattered now was getting to that Rugby World Cup game in Tokyo. Watch the full adventure at crugby.vhx.tv. That's C like S-E-E rugby.vhx.tv. Hey, buddy. All right. Be easy. So, and you were saying like with, with those guys, you know, they, you guys been playing, they've been putting your body, why not go over to Japan? Did, was yeah. outside of obviously, you know, 
pay as a job. What was there other incentives that they like provided where they were just like, look, like for you, I guess, in decision, was it just like, you know what? I like Japan. Japan's a dope, dope. Tokyo is a dope city. I, yes. I would love to be able to live here versus, hey, yeah. let me go to Paris where I could hurt my body, but you know, it's that. Like, was it just that or was it just like they, they also incentivize, like, okay, we'll take care of this, we'll take care of this, we'll give you work, whatever? Yeah, I think they made it very comfortable for us as as players. Even when I went there at the end of 91, into uh, my first season was 92, but I had to sit down, I think, for three or four months. There's a sit-down period. Um, uh, but, I mean, I just I just felt really, really comfortable. I felt like, you know, they're really going to take care of you. And it's mm-hmm. it was just a really nice environment they created for, for the players and things like that. So, that yeah. No, oh, that's really dope. So – when you went to Japan, look, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the compliment because you know I'm gonna continue always doing it. You have really great business acumen. All right. Mm-hmm. Your your business acumen has been prolific over these years. Was your time in Japan uh, a contributory to that business acumen, or was it something that was already innate? No, you know, geez, that's that's actually a really good question. Um, you know, I I, I was pretty flaky I'm, I'm not gonna lie you know i was in my, my my mid-20s and i hadn't i had a big stinky stink uh, uh student loan at home and i was like you know i had a ton of bills and i just didn't handle things very well and i was like a bit you know my, my life was my rugby and i uh you know so uh anyway i think it really instilled a sense of discipline in my life in terms of sticking to a schedule i had to be super super fit all the time too i mean mm-hmm. It's so competitive. You can, I mean, they can re-sign a guy. You, you, you may be in a two or three year contract, but it's always hanging over your head. If you, you know, you want to, A, you want to start every game. And so, and right. B, you don't want to lose contract. So you, you don't let yourself down. So I was, I was really like, all of a sudden I started watching my diet. I started really focusing on how I was training. And I, I, I always wanted to be the, the, the fittest guy in training camp. Um, and, and I, so that sort of instilled a lot of discipline in my life. And then I started thinking about, well, listen, I got to get something out of this more than just, you know, making a bit of dough and, and you know, playing playing rugby and, you know, having experience, of, you know, working in Japan. So I started learning, you know, I started studying Japanese and then they sent me to school there and I went to Japanese school for seven and a half years. And, you know, yeah. I, I still speak pretty good and I write pretty good. So that was a pretty good um, thing to le- have learned and nice. taken out of as an asset. And just the other thing is just being around, you know, in Tokyo, there's a lot of successful people there and just kind of feeding off the people and, and you know, seeing these guys, how they're over there, they're successful. I want to be part of that gang too. Like what happens when I finish playing rugby, you know, I walk up with a little bit of dough, but it's not crazy dough. It's like, right. I still got to work. I still got to figure my way through this, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I think that really helped me think about how, am I, what am I going to do? What am I going to do when I finish playing rugby? I need to have a game plan. I need to be, you know, and I need to be strict. I need to, you know, invest properly and have, a, and have something that I really want to do in the future after rugby's done. So, Definitely was that was for me the best thing I got. I think the best thing I got at Tokyo was just learning a real sense of discipline, a, a real hard drive, and translating that that work ethic that you had on the pitch into yeah. uh, into later successes, like you know, like you say, um, businesses or in life in general, right? I, and I can imagine because you, you talk about you worked for IBM, and I, I feel like every story that we hear about when it comes to IBM always yeah. is like. Very hard nose. Everything is by the book. Like the reason Microsoft was able to jump on was because they were just, they knew this t- hardware, but the software is just a whole other element. Like in Japan, which we already talked about the work ethic, like that, that amount, like, was that a true accurate statement to, to say like IBM is super by the book and <laughs> I, I, listen, I, I don't want to sugarcoat my my time at IBM. I, I don't want to tell you guys I was some kind of computer engineer because clearly I'm not. Um, <laughs> you know, I spent a lot of time rewriting uh, some of these Japanese guys' letters because they had, you know, correcting their English. But you know, here's here's the thing. So you know, they took really good care of me. I, they wanted my my focus was the rugby, and and they you know even though before '95, before rugby was uh, officially uh, uh, professional, you know, I, I mean, I had to go to the office every day. I had to wear, you know, a jacket and come in and <laughs> hang out with all the boys and, you know, go to lunchroom and, 
you know, eat my bentos and, and do all that stuff as a corporate guy. And I had my little IBM pin and I went to all the uh, the meetings and I just sat there for, you know, in the, in the room and everyone's speaking Japanese. And I'm just like over my head, what's going on here? I'm just like smiling, you know, <laughs> like, you know, whatever. I, I, oh, I didn't man. have any, any real responsibilities except make sure I, I made training and played the games. Uh, so that was, that was that. And uh, even some of the other boys, like some of the, like Jamie Joseph and some of the guys who worked for some of these factories, they would literally be walking around in factory coveralls, even though they weren't doing anything. Right. It was the funniest thing. I'd go, I'd meet these guys, you know, uh, for a lunch or something. And I'd see these guys walk, walk up on their corporate coveralls. I'm going, <laughs> fashion police, get rid of these guys. Like, I just laugh my, my, my ass off because they, but that was the thing. I mean, they worked in, they worked in, they worked for a company that manufactured. So they were, they were wearing these corporate issued coveralls and, and right. uniforms. But then 95 after 95 world cup, um, all that went out the, uh, went out the window and yeah. we no longer were required to come to the office and do all that, st that stuff. And we, uh, we were just focused on training and, you know, uh, games and, you know, just, it was just rugby then. And, and, uh, which made it a lot, a lot easier. I, I, I hated taking like commuters, commuter trains in, in Tokyo. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Yo, no, look, that's, that's real talk. Like I can imagine in '95 where you have less trains, the bullet trains aren't even there yet, and you're already stuffed in, and you're just this big dude, almost six foot big dude, yeah. just stuffed in these yeah. trains. Yeah, I just sit there and, and sweat like in these, <laughs> in these overcrowded. Shinkansen's, you know, just lumpy looking, just like this. And there's all these you know, salary men, you know, just squeezing into me. And I thought they can't possibly, they cannot fit any more into this, into this. Period. Yep. They push you. Find a way. Guys Look, push this, you is, this is sand in a glass. All right. We will get as much into it as possible. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, no, no, but that's that's I I can imagine. I, wait, did you ever have to do any of those Japanese commercials? Like you know, there's always a fame of like uh, a Japanese commercial of an American just so exaggerated on it. Did you have to do it as like maybe an, for the? I, I, only, I only wish I was that famous gift. I I, will be, <laughs> I only wish, but uh, I would have loved to have done a Suntory commercial. You know, oh. <laughs> Bill Murray. You know, lots of translation. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, but I know I was lucky because uh, my buddy Glenn played for Suntory. That was Eddie yeah. Jones's uh, team for for years and years. Right. So he was coach there for all through the mid nineties. Yeah, man, it's dope. Okay, so all right, we're looking at now this era of rugby, and I, I and, and I kind of want to now just kind of get some conversation and talk a little bit about Bangkok later. But uh, George Hook, who you know, George Hook from, from Ireland, uh, the commentator, former player. Yeah. He said one thing that's changed in rugby was the fact that the spectators are no longer just the ex-fan, uh, ex-play or players who watch rugby, but more, you know, people from the outside. And he's looked at it as a change for the negative. You've mm -hmm. seen literally probably the best progression of rugby over the period of time. And you spoke really about like, the guys working with you on the docks and, and being able to also play from your opinion, as you watch like the development of rugby from the kids that you work with to your peers and, and, and these generations that work with you, do you feel like the way that people have viewed rugby has changed for the better or maybe for the worse because they're a little bit more disconnected from the top players? Um, I mean, it's definitely such a bigger game. It's, I mean, we would have a hard time back in my day. I mean, when, when the Tri-Nations would come on, when you see, you know, uh, actually there was no Tri-Nations. It was the Bezel Cup because South Africa weren't even allowed to play rugby back in the, in the early 90s. So, I mean, there wasn't a lot of rugby on TV and you're right. I think there was definitely the people who were watching it and going to the games, there wasn't as many games. So it was more, you're right, it was the club guys. It was the club people. It was the people who played rugby. Um, it was, that was the base. And, and I think now there's a lot more rugby. It's, it's more accessible. It's on TV. People want to go and be part of it. Even, and you're right. I mean, I, I mentioned earlier on when, you know, the Vancouver Sevens are on and 80% of the people in the, in the stadium don't know how, they don't know what a scrum is. You know, right. So that's, like, people are going for, for, the, for the event 
in, in the selfies and all that kind of stuff. It's a, it's, it's a different vibe to me. Now you, I could be sitting in a, in a game and some, there'll be people like yelling things out cause they don't actually understand the game, you know? So it's just like, there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot to that. There's definitely, I think this generation now, there's a lot of people just going to watch rugby for the sake of watching rugby and mm -hmm. the atmosphere of the stadiums and things like that. I mean, is that, is that what you're, so I mean, yeah, I guess in, in a sense, because it, it, it is it is something I guess the basis of what I'm asking is a lot of the fact that I, I'm a big believer uh, that rugby is it's impossible for rugby to grow without casuals. I think yeah. the, the era of being able to have that die hard support, everything uh, put you up to a certain cap. Uh, yeah. But again, with anything that changes, I think we have a lot of rugby that a lot of people that are uh, let's call it rugby purist that don't like yes. to see a lot of that change, but those changes become necessary for casuals. Right. Yeah. I, I think I get, you know, I mean, sorry, <laughs> this is a heavy question. Hey, look, uh, man, we come, we come with it. <laughs> after a few beers. Right. But uh, no, no, no. So I, uh, you know, I get it. Like, okay. I hope I'm not going to like answer this incorrectly, but for me personally, I, I think you're, I think rugby watching rugby for me, it, especially this last World Cup, it was yeah. so frustrating, like having something so over-refereed and over-officiated. I mean, it's just too much with the TMO now. And it's 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 confusing to us old school guys who, who aren't used to all this stoppage and all this all these delays. But I, I understand like they're, and I think this goes back to your original question. It's like, we're trying to bring more people into watching rugby and, and they're trying to like, make it more understandable to people who don't really understand rugby. They've never played it, never really, you know, lived it. And, and so if we don't get these guys understanding the game, then we're going to lose that whole audience. Right. So I think they're yeah. just trying to um, make, make the offici officiating a bit more, I don't know, like, like I said, right? obviously it's, I, like I said, I don't enjoy it because I think it's over officiated, but I think yeah. there's a necessity but then that plays on too. There's some safety issues that they have to, you know, in this in this day and age, it, there's always they, people covering their asses. Like, oh, well, we got to mm -hmm. make sure the tackles are here. We got to, you know, um, the scrummaging now. We got to do it this way because we can't have guys coming in and slamming each other. Like the rucking rules now. I mean, they're 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 simplifying things in a lot of ways, but then they're confusing. Like they're making things more confusing by the officiating as well in, in a lot mm -hmm. of ways with a lot of stop and start. And so it's kind of a for me, it's a give and take, you know, um, yeah. some of the rules are great. Um, but then some of the over officiating and some of the, the yellow cards and the red cards and all that is just, it's, it's way, way overdone. Yeah. And, and that was, I, I think that was a point that, that I remember George was saying in, in, in different show we were talking, but like, it was like, doesn't recognize the game the same way. And, and for me, you know, being, I only started playing or really paying attention to rugby in 2009. So sure. I caught it like right as we're starting to transition out of the older school. Once the Olympics started getting into the radar, where they were like, "Okay, let's uh, let's make this a little bit different. Let's uh, let's see if we can open this up a little bit more." So the changes don't feel very jarring to me. But yeah, again, I, my perspective varies simply because of the fact I came into uh, more or less recent time, even though it's like 15 years ago. Yeah. So that's I don't know how recent that is. I, mean, I would I would hope. Yes, I would hope that the people who make these decisions, and there are a few, that they're doing it to make it more more of an enjoyable game, uh, easier to watch. Um, for me, because I I'm I'm a dinosaur, I come back. You know, I've been I, I'm an old school player. Uh, rugby was a lot more violent. Rugby was self policed. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, many a rankings happen, happen to yeah. punish people for games. Yeah. <laughs> and and I'm, I was always okay with that. Um, but yeah. now that's that's not we're, we're not we're not barbarians. We gotta you know we gotta play. You know, as people say, we're what is it? Soccer is a no. So, soccer is a gentleman's game played by hooligans, mm -hmm. and is a hooligans game played by gentlemen. Something like that, right? <laughs> uh, anyway, now. Uh, so anyway, I think, yeah, I think they have a duty to probably clean up that aspect of the game and, uh, you know, make it a bit more enjoyable, easier to watch. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, just, I'm hoping they're, they're getting things right, but I just think they, it definitely needs to, they need to, you know, tighten things up. Some of this, some of this officiating stuff, it's just, oh, it's yeah. killing the game. It, it slows it down to a point where it's just like, well, you're, you're losing that, that, that uh, advantage of the momentum that was part of the game inconsistency. Well, you can you imagine it's waiting there for like three or four or five minutes 
for a TMO to replay, replay, replay. Everyone's sitting there like, what is going on? Like, right. It's sport is like you build it up, you build it up, you get excitement going. And then all of a sudden, well, we're going to, sorry, folks. It's like, take a, take a five minute time out here. Right. You know, we're we're going to figure this out. Like get on with it. Right. Like, exactly. Constantly. And yeah. even worse, which is, which is one reason I I've really, I despise TMO because you know, American football, I understand instant replay. I understand referees review, but whatever happens within that point of referee review, the decision is made right there on the field prospectively. Yeah. I don't wait yeah. for somebody from over here to confirm it. I don't wait until the play starts again to establish the card after I don't know what ugh, it's yeah. the rage is going in again. There was I forgot what it was. I think it was the New Zealand, New Zealand, France. No, no, not, yeah. maybe it was New Zealand, France, or maybe it was that one where they like it was five minutes of stoppage for the TMO, a determination of yellow or red card while he's in the sin bin. And then game starts, and then you get the card. I'm like, wait, why did we wait for that? Like, my whole strategy changes with the accept sure. understanding that after you made your decision, we go, and I'm gonna not think about this ever again. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's frustrating, but you know, there's no. I mean, I'm not the guy to to figure that out. I mean, <laughs> I I just find it frustrating for personal reasons, and I just I would like to see the game change you know in a different direction i mean away from that over officiating and, and the tmos and all that sort of stuff i like them to tone that down a little bit uh but uh you know who knows what'll happen i just uh yeah it's just uh it can be super super frustrating for sure mm. yeah so on the other side of it off the field and this is the part where i, I feel like you've done well and i talked about it entertainment within surrounding the sport and being able to create that in-game experience what was the rep? What for you when it came to Bangkok tens um, and the the years like you started making it into a full event, bringing in the cheerleaders, working with the sponsors, and then subsequently streaming games? For you, what was that motivation, or who motivated you to go from, hey, this is just a social tournament, to, man, this is like lights as camera action event. Um, you know, I don't think I needed motivation gift. It was just a progression. It was like, I always had a vision that, I mean, I, I want to do things like, I want to do things really well. And I, I don't want to just kind of wing things. And like, I saw all these tournaments and, you know, I just found them so unprofessional and I just found them kind of like half hearted. And I was like, mm -hmm. mm, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it right. And I'm going to try to put a, 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 a level of a professionalism into this thing that, 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 that I, that comes with me, you know, mm. I, cause I have standards, you know, and, and building a business and, you know, being a fairly successful athlete, I mean, I, I, I want to instill that into whatever I'm involved with. And, and so I just, that was from day one. I mean, I, it, obviously when you're starting something fresh, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it takes time to build that up. Right. So the mm. first two or three years were, were, were difficult, but then, you know, we started getting traction and then teams coming from, you know, all over the world and, um, you know, it was all a lot of word of mouth and people saw what a great event it was, how much fun it was to play in and just the vibe of it all. And it was like, people, you know, refer to my tournament as a bucket list tournament now. Right. So it's yeah. just like, it's, it's something you got to go to just have a great time and um, enjoy Thailand as well. Right. So it's just something you, you know, that people really, really enjoy now coming to. And like I said earlier on, I mean, I think the players that come feel like they've been treated really like fairly and properly. I remember going to some of these tournaments, Gift, and I remember it was in Manila Tens, and we played uh, we played quite well on the first day. Came came, you know, came hung, hung over on on the, on the second day of the tournament. <laughs> we had a first game at eight o'clock against some young team full of you know, piss and vinegar, and they just ran us ragged, and they totally upset us. We were the top seeds. We'd won the tournament, I think, five times, you know, and then it was just it was mind blowing. But so we lost that first game. And we were literally in the beer garden at 8.15 in the morning. Yeah. We were out. So you had all, all of us who flown from all over the world to go, to go you know, halfway across the Manila, you right. know, and then we play one game on the Sunday and it's like, yep, sorry guys, you're out. We lost one game. It's like, like it can't, it doesn't, it shouldn't work like that. You've got people mm -hmm. who've invested time and money to come over to these locations and play, you know, quality rugby. Mm -hmm. So you've got to structure the tournament so that these, these guys aren't getting knocked out or these gals as well. We got, girls and kids and everything right. right so they're not getting knocked out at eight o'clock in the morning and their day's over that's not the way the tournament should work so 
we know we have you know pools where the guys you know you know if you lose your first game well it's okay because you're just going to go down and play a team that's probably more in your in your range of, of, right. of ability right? right so um and that was the one thing i wanted to make sure that teams really got value uh for 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 the participation they you know they weren't just gonna end up in the beer garden at, at 8 15 like us idiots did <laughs> <laughs> no let's let's be honest like uh I feel like you guys probably weren't exactly mad at it. It's like, oh, man, well, we got to start this up again. Oh. <laughs> now I wouldn't give a shit. I mean, I mean, hey, early days in the beer garden, I didn't like it any better, right? Um, <laughs> no, but now, I mean, I'm a, but then when you're, you know, you're, you're in your late 20s, early 30s, you're like, you know, I want to get out there and play more, more, more footy. Right. It's just like, a true story. But uh, you, I think you get my point. You want to make sure that these guys come over here and get a full, a full experience. You're treated well. They're going to, Part of their asses off at night. They're going to play good rugby during the daytime, uh, and they're going to go home satisfied. They're going to tell other buddies, "Hey, I had the best time that tournament. Bangkok Rugby Tens, amazing time, right?" So, hey, we got a we got actually we had a girls team coming over. Um, she's a. I feel bad because I I know they're from from Denver, Colorado. Uh, oh, I'm just trying to think uh, of the name. Jeez, damn it. Okay, I can't think it right now, but uh, yeah. So we got a we got a U.S. girls team coming over. I'm, I think they'll uh, they're going to be a, a big contender for the girls division this year for sure. Um, man, man. Well, that's exciting. No, no, right. I, I know I know a couple people from over here that are going over. Actually, it was funny. Um, one guy, uh, man, his name slipped my mind right now. That I met in Bangkok tens ended up finding out that he lives in, he lived in Missouri and he ended up finding out. Oh, we we have mad connection and ended up covering his game. I think when he was with Lindenwood. Um, derivative team i can't remember the name but it was it started at bangkok in the most random connection so yeah. uh, to see more people coming over I, i'm absolutely here for it now there's one question that i have actually truly had since day one that have always confused me your sponsor mm -hmm. all right yeah. i'm in the state all right getting people to jump on board is like I say people say pulling teeth. No, pulling teeth is easy. All right. This is pulling bricks on top of a tanker in the middle yeah. of a volcano. All right. <laughs> like I, I would assume that whenever you're in a country like Thailand where rugby is not a prevalent area, prevalent yeah. sport by any means, like right. this would be a process. For you, how has been working with the business community? How did you get to work with the business community in, in Bangkok to be able to get them to support your initiative? Yeah, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna backtrack a bit. It's like people always wonder how I ended up in Bangkok. You know, why when I when I finished, I was in Japan. I walked away from two year contract. It's because on my off season, I was coming to Bangkok and I met the 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 rugby community over here at the time and now. It's solid. It's we've got you know all the like people in 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 the finance, people in uh, all sorts of different industries. You know, they're all expats and they've all like not all of them, but I think there's a great majority of these people who, who all know of rugby and love yeah. rugby. And so the community that we have over here is is I wouldn't say it's super small, but it's 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 tight. You know, it's yeah. it's smallish, but it's super, super tight. And people, if they I mean, like listen, we're a nonprofit, we're run by volunteers. No one's getting paid for this. And I've got I've got probably on site I'll have fifty 50 people helping us out like for the weekend and the setup yeah. on the Friday before the event. These guys aren't getting paid. They just want to put something back into the sport, right? That shows you that there's a lot of interest. The, uh, the rugby community wants to help, you know, build this thing out. They know that it's a charity event, which is a big deal as well, right? So when you go to a corporation, you know, like I'm talking to, you know, the Sheraton Four Points, whoever, and I say, hey, listen, we've got, we're supporting these kids in an in, in orphanage, you know, and, and, you know, are you interested? And, you know, they, they'll put their name to that. Right, they, mm -hmm. they'll say, "Okay, this this makes sense. It's a community event. Um, the ex, expats support it. We've got teams coming from all over the world. It's it's a it's kind of an I wouldn't say it's an easy sell because we don't we don't actually get a ton of money through sponsorship. We get mm -hmm. we get enough to get us through, but um, you know, uh, we we seem to be okay. We seem to be well respected and we're trustworthy. Yeah. You know, we got you know all, we got all the." checks and balances covered so we've got a committee uh, you know a volunteer committee who goes through everything and you know so i think we check a lot of boxes off for 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 the expat community and and corporations who want to trust us with their money no I, and that makes a lot of sense you know trying to find a better interest and 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 that 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 clicks and because again 
when you look at the way that you guys structure your event, like right. it feels like a production. And I, I'm gonna keep reemphasizing. I know it's like the fifth time, but I'm gonna keep yes. reemphasizing it because it is so important, in my opinion, on yes. how you present that rugby, and it makes it something that even if you're not a rugby person, you right. can find a level of enjoyment any part of it. There's a layer to it each time. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, we got bouncy castles for the kids. We got face painting. You know, we got all this stuff going on. We, you know, and one of the things I do, I like say I go to a company and they say, oh, you know, Eddie, that sounds really interesting. And, and I want to support, you know, local communities and things like that. But I'm not quite sure. So, you know, do me a favor. I'm going to give you a couple of passes to our VIP section. Yeah. You come there, you enjoy some free food, have a few drinks on us and just observe and right. tell me that you're not going to want to buy into this thing because – you know, it, it. You know, you're going to feel so good about being involved in this in this community event that you're going to want to come back, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's how much confidence I have in this, right? So, another thing is, you know, we're not looking for a gazillion dollars, and we're we're just looking for enough to get by and make sure that the kids are doing okay. Every right. year, that's my plan. If I can get, you know, X amount of dollars, and that's not a huge amount, right? Then I can make sure that our kids' programs, these kids in the orphanage, you know, they can. They can stay involved with the game, so that's that's ultimately our goal. We go year by year, you know. So, yeah, uh, I love it. All right, come to the conclusion on this. I want to actually talk a little Noxu before let you go and and talk a little bit about the kids because I had the chance obviously for the uh, the bike ride to be able to meet them. Literally, yeah. some of the dopest kids ever met. Yeah. I, I don't even really like being around kids, and I was like, these kids are so bloody entertaining. These yeah. boys just like they just want to have fun. They just yeah. want love and just they're yes. they're willing to just to play. Yeah. How'd your involvement get with them? Well, you know, you're right. The kids are sponges, man. They just they just suck in all the love. I mean, these are the poorest of the poor. They're 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 they're, un, they're, they're unwanted. They're they unwanted. They just parents dumped them off at the orphanage and Sayonara, right? Um, so when you got, you know, strong role models coming to their lives, um, they just gravitate you, man. They just, they just want to be part of that. And, um, it's really touching. You know, we just did a, well, we just didn't, it was last December, end of December, we did the Christmas party and one of my buddies sponsored it. Um, another part of the community guys. And, you know, so we did all these games, you know, they swimming in the ocean, they ate like, you know, Kings and Queens and, you know, we gave them all Christmas gifts and it was just a real beautiful event. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice to be able to, you know, spend time with these kids and, and, you know, try to help them through their difficult situations and like through the sport, you know, that I think I mentioned before, like the, you know, the, the life skills, like these kids, you know, they take care to care of each other you know, on the field. You, you see that back in the boys home. Now when we go there and we visit these kids and it's just like, you see the camaraderie, they're all wearing their rugby shirts. And it's just like, they, they seem to have this purpose in their life now that they, that, they didn't in the initial days when we first started the program. I just I didn't see those bonds. And now you got kids in the orphanage who are like sixteen taking care of the the under eights, you know, and they're out in the field trying to help these kids. And you know, so these kids have everything stacked against them. When they get in the field, it's all even. They go up there, and they're, they're savages. <laughs> yeah, yo, them. that was one, of, bro. They they play so hard. Yeah. They play so hard. Yeah. And oh uh, yeah, it's it was. It was genuinely one of the most endearing things. And I think it was probably, it again, throughout that whole trip, but it was the example of why I actually love rugby. The game itself is fun to play, but the yeah. spirit of it and how it can create those bonding connections, like, yeah. was barn on. And that was really pinnacle within that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like, and I don't know, I know we're running out of time here, um, Gip, but I, and I, but I think it's really important to, like, for me, and, and I, I don't know if everyone gets this or not, but I mean, I got so much out of rugby. So many people helped me along the way. Yeah. I mean, I was given so much opportunity through the sport, um, you know, and I just think, Jesus, I, I got I to gotta give back. Like, what am I going to do? Go back and dust off my old rugby jerseys and <laughs> talk to people what a hero. Like, that's bullshit to me. I don't care about stuff like that. I talk, I, I want to focus on helping youth and introducing people who, I think rugby is the greatest sport in the world and, and no offense to everybody else who thinks their sport, but I know rugby is the best sport in the world. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it, I know how valuable it can be as, as a, as an instrument to teach people life skills. And I just, I really, I'm, I mean, I want to put something back into it. I got so much of the sport. I want to really make sure that I feel good about, you know, putting, helping other people out 
because I was given so much. And I've sh- yeah. I was, I mean, here I am in Thailand, like, you know, uh, living my life and, you know, all because of rugby and all these people that helped me and all these connections, all these friendships I made, like there's, it's a rugby fraternity. And then they use that, you know, that term because it's, it's factual. You go to anywhere in the world, you rock up, you say, listen, I want to play rugby. I want to learn how to play rugby. You're, you're, you're welcome with open arms. My club here in Bangkok, the Bangkok Bangers, I mean, we've got probably 20, someone told me we have 24, 25 nationalities playing. I mean, you can walk up, you know, barely even to, barely even to walk and they'll still open the door and say, guys, come on, welcome this guy into the club. And, you know, that's the nature of the sport. You go anywhere in the world and that's the way, typically that's the way it's going to work. No, and that, that, that I think is 100%. It's, again, it is one reason why I continue to, because that network has proven itself to be so uh, instrumental to, yeah. to the way. Shoot, even being in Brazil plays into a factor of, of uh, my rugby life, uh, it, it directly and indirectly. So um, yes. I, I 100% agree with you on that one. But Eddie, yes. I, I, I want to say, you know, once again, thank you so much for being on to the show. I, I want to thank you and give you your flowers for being a pinnacle component of rugby history, uh, both Canadian and international. Um, you are one of the reasons why this sport is doing what it does. And I don't know if you truly know it, but I'm going to let you know it for sure. So my <laughs> my thanks to you uh, for, for all that. Um, is there a place I want to ask? Uh, is there a place where people can find you, connect with you, with either for Noxu or we didn't really talk so much about your your business, but you know, even no, connect sure. with you with uh, you know jerseys. But yeah. where can people connect with you, basically? Well, I mean, I, I'm I'm on Facebook, uh, Eddie Evans, and um, I'm on. I mean, my company is Extreme Rugby Wear. I'm an easy I'm an easy dude to track down. If you Google Bangkok Rugby Tens Extreme Rugby Wear. Uh, Google my name on Facebook. I, if you're a rugby dude, I'll probably accept you as a friend. I'm, I'm pretty desperate. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm always open. I mean, I'm, I, I love meeting people. I, I'm a social dude and very welcoming. And as you know, you know, I think you've been to my house before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, um, yeah, I mean, thanks for the time. I, I really actually, it's fun you know, chatting about things. It brings back a lot of old great memories. And, We've got a, a lot of work ahead of us this next three and a half weeks is this is crunch time. So we uh it's it's we I see the finish line. We're gonna get there. It's gonna be a great tournament, uh a lot of excitement and yeah. I'm excited excited to see all my friends and people from all over the world come back. Man, I'm looking for I'm looking forward to being back, man. It's it's been yeah. too long. Honestly, it's gonna be the first rugby that I've gotten to play since twenty eighteen. So uh <laughs> my body is about to feel all of it. I'm, I'm prepping, but I'm about to feel all of it. <laughs> bring, bring, bring your energy, GIF, because I'm getting you on the stage. You're going to sing with my band, okay? Yo, let's go. Let's go. Hey, like I said, I'm, I'm going to be ready. Joking, bro. You're on the <laughs> rock in. No pressure. No pressure at all. No pressure. <laughs> so, that just we don't we can't we're, we're we're down to like pennies. We can't even afford to, to get a real band. We have to use my band. <laughs> Free entertainment. Hey, look, this is what this is why we go. Hey, we you, you, yeah. it's not free entertainment. It's we're keeping it in the we're keeping it at home entertainment. It's, all right, keeping it within the, the community entertainment. Within the family, brother. Love it. <laughs> okay. No, yes. Look forward to it. Thank you so okay. much. Up on top. See you, buddy. <laughs> Eddie. Thank you so much for telling your story. Thank you for being willing to be a part of this. Look forward to doing this again. And of course, you guys can check out some of our other interviews and stories that we have done. Uh, We just talked with the legend Wendy Young, talked with the legends A.D. Cooney and Ty Lewis, the future Hall of Famer in rugby media, Lance Cavanaugh. Uh, We got the Nigerian Nightmare and Freddie Henry Ajudwa, we got the president of the rug, uh, the RS Rugby Foundation, and Mike Anderson, president of Prairie View a and Craig Dawson. We got Howard University co-founder Takunda Rusiki. We got uh, and, uh, 
USA Women's Olympic captain Nia Tapper. We got Roots Rugby founders Kyle and Tiana Granby. We got Blaine Scully, former captain of USA Rugby. We got so many people, y'all. We got so many. You got to check them out, man. And of course, our weekly stories keeping you up to date with what's going on around and in rugby all the time. But y'all, in the end, I thank you guys for taking the time. And I want you to know that I hope that you're happy. I hope that you are healthy. And most importantly, I hope that you know that you are highly favored. Until next time, y'all. Cheers.